It gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker uh, for today, uh, Professor Martin Meyer, who um, I like for two reasons. First, I attended a seminar for him uh, about three or four years ago, which I found incredibly visionary and very, very exciting. So it automatically clicked and I started looking at his amazing research since then. But more importantly, over our communication, I discovered he's a messy fan. So uh, that makes us friends. Uh, so Dr. Martin Meyer uh, hails from TU Berlin in Germany, where he did his undergrad and grad studies. Um, he brings an amazing experience um, as a professor and a head scientist in the Zeitgeist Lab. I hope I didn't butcher that. Um, in the Institute for National Research, Scientific Research in Quebec in Canada. There's a French version of that, which I will try not to butcher. But uh, Dr. Martin has been amazing in terms of the research he's been putting forward over the years. Even starting in 2007, he won the best uh, Comsoc tutorial award. And ever since then, he's been racking up the awards, which is amazing. And uh, a reflection of the visionary work he's been bringing to our society and communications over the years. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Martin Meyer. Okay, this should work. Okay, thanks very much, Ali, for these nice words. And thanks for having me to the steering committee who brought me against my will here. I had to show up uh, physically, but it was just uh, a joke. So again, Matthias, I press. Okay, going back. This is... The title of my talk is Interbeing in the Next G Era, okay, on the symbiosis between internet and human being. The last two, three years, I wrote two books. If I had to describe each book by a single word, I would pick the word convergence for the first book and emergence for the second book. And emergence kept me busy over the last maybe two, one, two years. And interbeing is the first idea uh, we created about emergence. It's not part of the book. And as a matter of fact, it's not even in any dictionary yet. To set the stage, I was thinking we get started with 6G, next G. How, what, what is the difference? There are subtle differences. And then also setting the stage uh, between multiverse and metaverse. Again, subtle dif differences. I tried to elaborate on them and try to make a case that both 6G, Next-G, Multiverse, Metaverse naturally lead up to interbeing. So let's get started with 6G and Next-G. So there's, let's put it this way, uh, there's a traditional way of looking at 6G by simply comparing it to 5G. So it's the same KPIs, but scaled up by a factor of 10, 100, or even higher. The same process, standardization process, has been kicked off. So that was 2018. Currently, we are here. So release 17 has been completed. Currently, this is 5G advanced. So there's a, a release 18 in the works coming out later this year. And there will be another release, uh, release 19 on 5G advanced. Okay. And then in the year 2025, the actual 6G standard, standardization will start with release uh, 20. So this is procedure business as usual. However, there's also another way of looking at 6G by looking at, taking a closer look to the enabling technology. So what, what will be different compared to 5G? On the left-hand hand, left hand side, you have a number of key enabling technologies. So for sure it will, uh, leverage terahertz communication frequencies, integrated sensing and communication will be key for, uh, for realizing perceptive mobile networks. Quantum technology will play, quantum computing will play a key role. And also there will be a transition from softwareization towards blockchainization. However, what I, wa was, what I wanna highlight is this AI 
Okay, so this talk is really more about intelligence. So 6G will be the first generation of networks which will be inherently AI native. And AI started, of course, in 5G, but there's a, a slight difference between 5G and 6G. So in 5G, it was more AI for networks. Okay, so AI was brought to the network. 6G will be network for AI. So you use the network in order to generate AI. Okay, and this gives rise to so-called intelligence endogenous networks, IEN. And in a nutshell, it's brain-inspired self-evolution capabilities. So you build networks that are capable of self-evolving towards uh, AI, all brain-inspired. I have to emphasize, so our North Star is the human brain. I emphasize because later on I will uh, come back to this. In terms of paradigm shifts compared to uh, 5G, Ericsson brought out this uh, widely cited paper. There are eight paradigm shifts. I want to highlight only three of them because they are particularly important in this uh, talk. Sustainable transformation will be important. Also, thinking in continuums will be very, very important. This is only one type of continuum, cyber physical. Later on, you will see other types of continuums you should uh, take into consideration. And services beyond communication. Communication is a given. What else can networks do for us? And around these KPIs, you know, you have the different KPIs, different enabling technologies. At the core is the metaverse. Okay, the metaverse, there's even a metaverse roadmap out there. I put it in quotation marks because it's not officially standardized. It's just a, a, pub, a, a published metaverse roadmap. And this really goes beyond 6G. And this is exactly where NSF comes into play because NSF prefers to use the term next G compared to um, 6G. In the sense that NSF is not focused on cellular technologies only, but considers a broader scope of technologies. So last year we had our first IEEE Next G Summit, and there was Alex uh, Brinston giving an overview of NSF support of Next G research. This is taken from his paper. As you see, it's a timeline: next near term, mid term, long term Next G objectives as put forth both by uh, NSF, and you can see here at the very end, long-term thinking is metaverse, okay? And in the North America, meaning USA and Canada, we have this next G Alliance uh, uh, roadmap. So this involves all the major players in, in USA and, and uh, Canada. And there are some things which are worth highlighting. So it's not only technology per se, but also societal and economic needs are addressed specifically. They define six audacious goals. I just won't highlight the last one. So this is really about multi-sensory 6G world experiences that transform human interactions across physical, digital, and biological worlds. So it's not only cyber physical, that's the first hand towards uh, biological worlds. And this is verbatim taken from the roadmap. It's all about the symbiotic relationship between technological and human evolution. So it's symbiosis, explicitly mentioned, technology, human, and focus on evolution. Okay, I highlight this, it becomes clearer maybe in five minutes. So this already is a hint towards interbeing, symbiosis, evolution, technology, okay. Now we come from a different angle, multiverse and metaverse. So the uh, 6G is all about the fusion of digital and real worlds. And there's a, uh, an architecture that has been published already in 2011. It's the multiverse, okay? It's an architecture of extended reality XR experiences. As you know, XR includes VR, AR, but goes beyond that. On the right-hand side, you see the architecture uh, illustrated. So you have three physical dimensions, time, matter, and space. And each of these physical dimensions have a digital counterpart. So time is replaced with no time. It's autonomous events. 
space, real places, is replaced with virtual uh, places. Likewise, matter can be extended to no matter bits. And these three pairs of physical digital dimensions give rise to eight types of reality. You know, reality, as you, you recognize, it's AR, but also other types of reality. The important part is when you design experiences in the multiverse, a user should start in one type of reality and transverse into one or even more other uh, reality realms. And this gives rise to the cross-reality environments we are very much interested in. More importantly, it's an architecture which should be used as an experience design canvas. It's really about experiences, okay? And here you can see the 3D previous picture uh, plan, uh, panned out on, on a, a two-dimensional surface. So you have this uh, six different dimensions and each can be calibrated according to your uh, uh, desires in order to uh, design experiences. This is what, what we did in our first idea, Internet of No Things. I give full credit, the term Internet of No Things was coined by Demos uh, founder Rupi Moka back in 2015. The story behind it is that 6G might usher in the post smartphone era. So the post, uh, the smartphone gets increasingly replaced with smart wearables, such as goggles or haptic clothes. And in the long run, even these wearables will be disappearing and get replaced by nearables, such as AI-enhanced MEC or social robots. This is something, uh, our rough idea, so I will not go through this. It's kind of humans are involved, haptic communication, tactile internet, human-robot collaboration. I keep it simple here. We realized it in our lab. So again, I will not touch on that's blockchain involved, but this talk is not about blockchain. I want you to focus on the human centeredness. Okay, the human is put at the center of our solution and each human can engage in two types of communication. The first one is human robot. In body communication, we use Pepper from SoftBank and Pepper is one example of the multiverse characterized by the dimension of space time matter. And then the human can alternatively engage in human avatar online communication. An avatar can be described by the dimensions of the multiverse, no time, no space, no matter. These two types of com uh, communication are overlooked by IBM Watson Empathic AI services. Okay, so an empath it's uh, IBM Watson tone analyzer. It's a tool that allows you to detect the emotions in written text. So you, you, uh, the human user was communicating with a robot avatar overlooked by IBM Watson just to detect emotions. And this is what we did. It's called Empathic AI Services. So we ran an experiment with several users. You have here the timeline. This is roughly 15 minutes. And, and the user first interacted with a robot, okay? So and this robot, again, if you use multiverse dimension, it's characterized by space-time matter. And then depending on the user, maybe five minutes, two minutes, depending on their experience, they were asked to interact with a virtual avatar, which again is characterized by no time, no. And all these interactions, so we started in reality, then there was a transition phase from reality to virtuality, and during these experiences, we monitored the user's uh, ex uh, emotions, okay, such as uh, confidence, analytical thinking, joyfulness, and tentative meaning simply neutral. That's, that's no emotional impact. And the, the uh, observations we made were very clear. So in the beginning, it was very messy. So there's no clear trend. But once users start to enter in the transition phase, things become much clearer. And the longer the virtuality phase continues, the picture gets very clear. So the positive emotions such as joy, confidence, are not only very stable, but also very high in score. So a score of one is the maximum, meaning all users experience that. And this, the lower curve is tentative, meaning neutral, kind of, oh, I don't care. So this is constantly decreasing. So virtual reality is a very engaging environment. And this is what we look into more and more in detail. 
There's a famous book published by Stanford University Virtual Human Interaction Lab already back in 2011. It's called Infinite Reality. And in this book, you find frequent references to the both, both novel Snow Crash, that's where the term metaverse comes from, and Neuromancer, that's where the movie Matrix comes from. Okay, so people might think metaverse matrix is something new. No, no, it has been around for quite some while. And the de definition of VR is given in this book. It's virtual reality is an exercise in manipulating uh, perceptions. I emphasize this already because you should not be surprised by what uh, generative AI is doing. You know, this is the real goal of generative AI to manipulate our perceptions. I will get back to this in the in this third part. And as examples of infinite reality, the book mentions virtual immortality and eternal life. So it gets really kind of philosophical, whatever you name it. And it's it's actually very simple to, to realize. Uh, within uh, five minutes of virtual experiences, you can track uh, people's idiosyncrasies, their behavior, the way they talk, the way they think, the way they react. And these tracking can be used to uh, replicate your virtual avatar. Also, it's an opportunity to talk to long since past ancestors and affect future. I want to highlight this. So this is, you might know this metaverse company, Somnium Space. It's one of the leading um, metaverse companies. And this is a feature they published, I think, last year. Immortality is here, exploring live forever mode. So this is becoming a reality, but it has been foreseen already in this book. And now I want to uh, play a little video, just one minute, you know, just to give you an, a, a taste of what is possible. Eternal life. So this is was published, I think, last year in South Korea. And I show you one minute of this video just to highlight what is possible. So it's a real story. It's a mom who lost her daughter. And three years later, they were virtually reunited. Okay, so it, there will be it will be in Korean, but there is uh, there are English subtitles. So just read the English subtitle. Okay, I stop here. This is done by using AI real time rendering, apparently VR and haptic globes. Okay, it's a convergence of technologies. And this is what's happening in experiences. So this is when you talk to psychologists, they have this notion of a unitary continuum. Remember what I've said before, cyber physical continuum, that's another type of continuum. I will point you to other continuums you should pay attention to. And it's simply, this is how we humans experience uh, uh, sensations. So in, in a normal state, normal life, we are in this. This mode self is clearly separated from world. We have an identity of ourself, but depending on this intensity of emotions, this uh, border between self and, and uh, world is increasingly blurred, okay? And VR is somewhere here, O, inspiration, or if you recall these uh, eternal life, virtual immortality, you get even closer to this realm of experiences, peak and mystical experiences. I bring this up, remember, just to set the stage for interbeing. So here, fusion of self naturally lends itself to a term interbeing. Okay, remember, interbeing is really a term. It's not in the dictionary yet. And this will be the main part I will uh, focus on in this uh, keynote. Six, she is all about intelligentization. So we go from network softwareization to network intelligentization using AI. In 2020, the MIT Press published this book by James Lovelock. You might know him or not. He passed away last year. That is his last book. And he foresees a coming age of hyper intelligence. Okay, so what is hyper intelligence? These are cybernetic organisms that will emerge from existing AI systems by having access to the quantum realm. And they will think first thousands, then millions of times faster than us. So our intelligence is gone. They will outperform us when it comes to uh, reasoning. 
However, there's a difference between hyperintelligence, and you might know the term from Oxford University, superintelligence. So superintelligence is very dark, meaning, okay, they will be so smart, they will be our overlords, they will dominate us. Hyperintelligence is a different concept. It will lead to a mutual beneficial symbi symbiosis between humans and cybernetic organisms with the overarching goal to keep the Earth livable by building a self-sustaining intelligent planet. And importantly, the cybernetic organisms will be so advanced, they will regard us, humans, as we now regard plants. Okay, and this is now we're getting into biology. Remember, Next Year Alliance foresees transformation, human transforming human interaction across physical, digital, and biological worlds. So if our role will be plants, it doesn't have to be necessarily a bad news. The key is you have to understand biology a little better, and I strongly recommend this book, came out, I think, uh, last year, by a British man, James Bridle, Ways of Being, Animals, Plants, Machines, The Search for a Planetary Intelligence. And there's the third and final uh, continuum I want to bring in here. There's an evolutionary continuum of human and more than human intelligence such as the wood white web. And this will be the focus of this uh, keynote, the wood white web. So the point is, be beside digitalization, we also should study biologization. So it's not only that we come up for a uh, digital solution, we also have to biologize our digital networks. What is biologization? Biologization is also known as pioneering or biomimicry. So we look at nature, we try to mimic biological life. And this is anticipated to create major, major uh, opportunities to come up with really uh, disruptive uh, ideas. According to Glenn Albright, he's an Australian uh, academic, we have to exit the current human-centered Anthropocene and enter a new era he calls symbiocene. Okay, symbiocene is a new era putting focus uh, on symbiosis. Okay, and is, this is something we are currently working on. We try to mimic symbioses found in natural systems. It's called sim symbiomimicry. And a prime example of symbiomimicry is the so called mycelium internet. Okay, it's also known as nature's pro-social internet or the wood wide web. It has been published in nature about 20 years ago. And it got back then a lot of uh, attention, but now it's, 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 it's entering the engineering space too, given these are the official terms, mycelium internet and wood wide web. The interesting part is it's a very good example of symbiosis. Symbiosis per se doesn't have to be good or bad. There are different flavors. This is taken from Wikipedia. So it can include competition. So you have two species and they harm each other. It's called competition. Then you have different combination. Another one is parasitism. So one side benefits, another one does not. And then you have mutualism. So both sides benefit and this is what Wood by web does, as explained more. So when we started in, in digging in this uh, research, we were clueless, okay? So what we did is we went to IEEE Explorer. I checked it yesterday. Currently there are zero uh, publications, not even early access papers on mycelium internet, okay? When I talked to my students, they say, oh, professor, there are no papers out there. I said, very good, you know? So this is, uh, fresh area of making some speculative research. And then we, I show you some vignettes, you know, just, you know, to show what we came across. So interestingly, the neuroscientists always noted a strong resemblance of our human brain with trees. So they use even the uh, term dendrites, which comes from Greek, dendron tree. So our brains look like little trees full of trees, like forest, okay? But they had no clue why it is. Okay, next minute. We know less about ocean floor than moon surface, even less about complex life under our feet. So we walk across planet Earth, but we never look below the surface. 
It turns out that there are more life forms in a handful of forest soil than people on planet Earth. Only in the last 20 years have ecologists looked into this and are gaining a more and better understanding. And there are fungal networks. These fungal networks interconnect trees, okay? And the symbiosis of fungal networks with trees is the wood wide web. And they are one of a kind. They are neither plants nor animals. They are between fauna and flora. Interestingly, these fungal networks, this mycelium internet, looks like our brain. So, uh, so the neuroscientists were thinking of trees and the ecologists are thinking of brains. So why is this similarity? Nobody knows, okay? And the trees act, this is uh, in, in our uh, language, trees act as routers and fungi as cables, however, are life cables. They are biological entities. And then we kept going, kept going, trying to get a better understanding. Also, Google got wind of that. So they invited uh, Professor Susan Simar uh, from uh, University of British Columbia in 2001 to give a talk at Google. And she is a pioneer of tree-to-tree -tree communication and forest intelligence. So we, we, we watched this. We reached out to, to uh, uh, Susie, Susan, to get more and more information. And the my mycelium internet is ubiquitous, okay? So all forests are interconnected by my mycelium internet and roughly 90% of all plants are interconnected. And importantly, the mycelium in, uh, exchanges not only information, but also resources. Remember, one of the paradigm shifts in 6G next year will be services beyond, beyond communication. And it's the cooperative forest internet that serves as nature's underground social network. So we all know our man-made social networks, as we know that they, they turn out not to be so social. It might be a good idea to look how nature maybe does a better job, okay? And this is something I now to explain in more detail. So there's another continuum. Fungi, flora, fungi, flora, continuum. It's okay, yeah, it's okay. So the wood white web spans this fungi flora continuum, okay? So underground, you might think of fiber optic communication. You have these fungal links, these fungal links, and they act as active cables. So they perform an exploratory process, branching and homing, in doing so, building the mycelium internet. And it, it has a brain-like structure for connection and communication. And ecologists talk about the term, they use the term root brain, okay? Then you have trees. As I said before, they act as routers connecting underground with above ground. But there's a second way of um, crossing this boundary, and these are mushrooms, okay? Mushrooms are different from fungi. Mushrooms are like the fruiting body of fungi, okay? So it's, it's, it's the mushroom helps fungi to exit the underground realm and enter the uh, air space. And mushrooms have one function to disseminate spores. I highlight this because later on I will get back to this when I talk about sporulating platforms, okay? Then above uh, air, above ground, you might think of wireless communication there are scent emails. Scent is what you uh, smell. And scent uh, mails are used between trees, okay? They exchange scent mails, but also between plants and animals. I give you two examples. For instance, if a giraffe starts eating leaves of, of, of a tree, this tree sends info chemicals to the nearby trees. The, upon receiving these sent emails from their fellow trees, the receiving trees start producing uh, toxic chemicals. Okay, once the giraffe goes from one tree to the other one, uh, the other tree already started producing uh, uh, toxic chemicals, and in doing so, the giraffe stops eating these trees. Okay, this is one type of communication to repel animals. And of course, there's the opposite, to attract animals. For instance, if this tree suffers from an insect pest, 
Okay, this tree produces again infochemicals which attract predators who feed on this insect. Okay, so this is uh, the fungi fluoride continuum. And this type of research, the so called tree fungi mutualism, is an entirely new uh, research area in ecology. So tree fungi mutualism. Also, please try this. Try to keep this in mind because I will translate it into cybernetics maybe in in three minutes. So this talk is all about interbeing. Remember, interbeing uses symbiomimicry. Okay. So this is. But the question is, what what kind of symbiosis are we trying to mimic? And we try to mimic symbiogenesis. Symbiogenesis is the major driving force behind evolution. So it's really symbio symbiogenesis is a function of organism, organisms, organisms mutually beneficial growing together to become one. Okay, this is what is happening in nature. We are coming from a networking perspective. What we are interested in is, okay, we want to become let internet and human becomings become one towards interbeing. How do we do this in technical terms? Well, we go back to Norbert Wiener's uh, cybernetics. And uh, Norbert, the core concept of cybernetics is circular causality, also known as teleo teleo teleology. So teleology is simply the study of feedback purpose. Okay, and this is something we use and applied it to the metaverse. Now, this is something we are now at the metaverse. This is our use case. We come from nature. Our goal is to achieve interbeing in the context of metaverse. The metaverse, there are many definitions. You talk to Zuckerberg, he defines it this way, Microsoft that way. There's the most basic definition coming from this recent book presented at Stanford University, I think half a year ago. And it's simply uh, the foundation for a future virtual society metaverse. In doing so, you know, the, it builds a stronger nexus between real and virtual worlds. This is illustrated here. You know, so this nexus between virtual worlds and real worlds, this is at the core of the metaverse. And it's all about creation and transfer of value we are human in the loop AI, okay? This is illustrated here, okay? We have human users and they interact with different types of AI and cybernetic organisms. So I want you to focus on this upper corner, the other, otherwise it gets a little bit too uh, uh, con uh, confusing. And you see here, so we have human interacting with different types of AI and there's a certain evolution going on. So what kind, kind of AI? You can think of intelligent smart contracts. So smart contracts are from blockchain. Usually they are very dumb smart contracts. It's just if then. If this happens, then this, you can make it more intelligent by introducing uh, such uh, features such as what if, okay? What if scenarios. Then intelligent stigmatic agents, meta-learning. Meta-learning is one AI nested in the other one and generative AI, okay? This is the focus of this talk. And we want to exploit generative AI to produce lifelike digital organisms, okay? And this is now, I put everything together. I know it's packed, you know, I want to simplify it. What we are trying to do is something, what's going on here underground, the wood white web, flip this figure and this underground part goes into cybernetic realm, okay? So we try to understand what's going on in nature's pro-social uh, network and try to realize it using generative AI. Okay, and this is now uh, the, the key, the, the, currently our, where we are working on. So really the design of lifelike cybernetic organisms. And at the, at the heart lies really this convergence of digital evolution with biology in order to uh, create lifelike cybernetic organisms. Lifelike cybernetic organisms is a general term. We are specifically interested in uh, realizing cyber fungi. Okay, so cyber cybernetic uh, mimics of fungi. Okay, 
And these symbiomimic symbio fungal networks tra uh, transfer of resources. So information is a given. What about resources? And fungi have a very interesting feature. They transfer resources from areas of abundance to scarcity, from larger plants to smaller plants. Nobody has a clue why this is happening because this is against evolution theory, but it's how nature works. The key word is entropy, okay? That's nature's hidden force driving life to equilibrium. So what we did is we used generative AI diffusion models in order to increase entropy. And the nice part about generative AI is you can also reverse time entropy. And this is against the laws of physics, as you might know, entropy, must always increase or stay the same. And that's why I mentioned this before, we have in ecology this uh, tree fungi mutualism, and we try to define a new research field for 6G and next g which we call human cyber fungi mutualism, okay? And this is something, early ideas, this is something I would want to spend maybe the remaining 10 more minutes on this, we call it magic, mushroom, and sporulating platform. So this is simply like fungi produces uh, mushrooms, mushrooms produces spores, and we try to mimic everything in cybernetic space, okay? So what is magic mushroom? We put it in, in quotes, we don't need, we don't mean the real magic mushrooms, but it, it leverages generative AI, well-known uh, feature of hallucination. So generative AI is able to ha hallucinate uh, solutions they were not trained for, okay? So hallucination is really a well-known feature of generative AI. The different types of generative AI, we focus on DDPM. It's called denoising diffusion probabilistic models. It's, it was created by OpenAI. And it has two um, procedures, forward, forward and backward. So in the forward diffusion, it creates increase in entropy disorder. And the interesting part is the backward process, okay? Denoising, reverse time entropy. So producing out of nothing, out of chaos order. This is illustrated here. So this is the reverse process denoising. This is white noise, okay? Nothing, randomness. But you go through these steps and out of a sudden a, a picture is hallucinated, okay? So we applied it, OpenAI's improved DDPM in order to symbiomimic a sporulating platform. This is now a little bit tricky to explain. So the left-hand side is easy. Like any open, uh, like any AI algorithm, training is critical. So training is really, there's a, a rule of thumb AI, 80% is training, okay? So first we validated uh, OpenAI's improved DDPM. Uh, we used two data sets, ImageNet64 and uh, Kaggle Celebs. This is from Google. This is widely used data sets from uh, AI community and computer vision. And we played with both uh, processes, forward, backward, forward, backward, and it does work wonderfully, okay? Next come uh, training. This was tricky. Like with any AI algorithm, you know, where does the data come from? Data is the, 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 the input AI algorithms feed on. So we did a comprehensive search, searching more than 7,000 data sets. There are some data sets out there, try it, okay? And it contains several data sets on specific aspects of mycelium internet, but only in small numbers, tens or hundreds. So we didn't find suitable data sets to train our open AI DDPM. And then we did further research, talked to ecologists, and it turns out that uh, forests, the under, underground networks have a certain, these networks have a certain topology. It's called scale-free networks with small world properties. Again, by the way, our brain is exactly structured as, as the mycelium internet. Our brain also has these features, small world, networks are scale-free networks with small world properties. Okay, scale-free networks simply means the nodal degree distribution follows a power distribution. Small world properties, there are two. The global path length is very small and you have high local clustering. So we synthetically produced 
uh, more than, I think, 1,300,000 tensors, so big numbers, in order to train our DDPM, okay? And this is something, this is our use case. So this is now a little bit, I always struggle to, to, to talk people through this. So all right, I try, maybe I succeed, I hope, I hope so, you know. If not, feel free to ask questions and then I'm almost done. So our goal is remember metaverse. So it's really kind of this nexus should become stronger, more resilient. So we want to wire and constantly rewire. It's a repeating dynamic process, metaverse is social, a virtual society. We look at nature and try to learn from it. So these two life cycles are uh, expressed in biological terms. So we have on the one side plant life cycle, okay? On the other side, mushroom life, life cycle. They bear striking similarities. So they cir circle around and around and around time and again, life cycle. On the one hand, uh, plant life cycle, it produces pollen, okay? Similarly, mushroom produce spores. Similar, but slightly different. So this is biological terms. And now when you talk about cybernetic terms, you have to translate plant and mushrooms into metaverse terms. So plants are like humans. Okay, remember cybernetic organisms will regard us as we regard plants now. And mushroom is cyber fungi's uh, uh, visible part, okay? So, and then our goal is interbeing. So what does interbeing mean? Specifically, it's the dynamics of and on the metaverse. What does it mean dynamics of? That's the structure of the metaverse, the networking topology. It should be created and constantly adapted. This is what we done uh, achieved by using our open AI, okay? So it produces these hallucinated uh, scale-free networks with small world properties. We use these hallucinated outputs to interconnect humans with mushroom, okay? And the mushroom is producing spores. Okay, what is spores? Spores is simply tokens, okay? Teleological tokens. Those of you are familiar with blockchain, Web3, NFT is one type of token, but I don't have time to, I left it out, otherwise it would be too confusing. This links to a Web3 a token economy, okay? And we were interested, you know, agency. So how do humans interact? among each other to cross-pollinate them, okay, to exchange pollen. Pollen are, in our use case, social norms, okay? So people, this is from social psychology, so how do people influence, and most of the time it's not by educating people, but by socially copying. So you see something, you like it, you, you adapt it yourself. So pollen is social norms, such as planting trees, and spores are rewards tokens, such as purpose-driven tokens. And this is, in, I'm done in maybe five minutes. These are our latest results. The use case is, our goal was spread of new social norms. Okay, this I know, I will break it down on the next slide. So we have our cyber fungi, open AI. It has recalled two processes, forward process diffusion, backward process hallucination. On the y axis, on the x axis, we go from left hand side to right hand side and then backward. From left hand side to right hand side is diffusion, okay, diffusion steps. We go first in this direction, then reverse. And in doing so, we increase entropy or decrease entropy. On the y axis, we have two different metrics. This is much easier to read, this it's, it's a subset of the previous figure. So we have on the y axis, the social contagion of all nodes. So we considered 64 uh, humans interconnected through a regular ring lattice, okay? And social contagion of all nodes is simply the number of time steps every human copies this new social norm, okay? So this is, we just took biological, biological contagion and mimicked it social contagion, okay? This is the time units and you see the blue line is the forward process. And first, it, it, the social contagion takes up, up to 25 time units. This little parameter R is simply the infection rate, okay? So 
if two nodes, two humans are directly connected, they can contage each other with a probability of R, okay? So this is our starting point, And then we have the diffusion process. And you see it reaches um, a lower limit of roughly uh, two point something uh, time units. And then we go from this reverse using our open AI. This is hallucinated. And you see going re reverse direction achieves the minimum number of required time units for any value of parameter R, okay? Likewise, uh, the second y-axis shows the actuation of teleological tokens. This is simply in the, uh, given in tokens. So two uh, directly linked humans who copy their behavior are rewarded by a token. And likewise, you know, you go with the green line is the forward process, reverse line is the dash. And you see here going first diffusion, hallucination, you end up in a, at a much higher uh, number of tokens. So this is already part of my conclusion. Remember, cybernetic organisms and beings will live together in a mutually beneficial symbiosis, but tele teleology comes from the Greek word telos, okay? That means purpose. What, why are we doing all this? All this cybernetic AI, open AI, what's the overarching purpose? To keep Earth livable by building a self-sustaining internet intelligent planet. So we keep reading, reading, reading many non IEEE publications, I must confess. And there's a famous book coming out by Greta Thunberg that was earlier this year. And it's a book not by her. It's an interesting book, almost 500 pages. It's the top 100 leading ecologists on climate uh, uh, change. And what was striking to me is something, the best solution we currently have to, to combat uh, climate change are forests. It's way better than CCS. You might have heard about these technologies, carbon capture storage. Forest trees outperform any type of CCS. That's why in Canada, that's where I work and live. We have initiative. They are dead serious about uh, planting trees like crazy. Two million, something similar you have in the US, Department of Agriculture. They shoot for one billion trees by 2030. In Europe, they shoot for three billion trees by 2030. So Governments are crazy about planting trees, but this is planted environment. Our research is more about built environment, okay? And this is our overarching goal, adapt modern metaverse to nature's ancient pro-social mycelium internet to realize a cybernetic forest for sustainable 60 and next ecologies, all watched over by machines of loving grace. These are not my words. Okay, I highlighted these words, cybernetic forest, all watched over by machines of loving grace. I'm an internet guy. If you go back to the initial thoughts of internet uh, pioneers such as Richard Brodigan, he put this forth, okay, prophetic vision about technology and nature. I strongly recommend to read papers, you know, in the 60s, amazing, okay? This is my last slide. So to, to sum up, so 60s is all about mimicking nature, you know, such as brain inspired stigma. So we look what, what our brain is supposedly good at, and then we try to apply it to 6G. What we are doing is something one loop further, we study more 6G, and it's not so much about copying our human intelligence, but more nature's intelligence. So we envision there should be a transition from artificial intelligence to what we call artificial naturalness, evolution and life. And this concludes my, concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. We really appreciate the lovely presentation. Time-wise, it's know, perfect. Time-wise, it's amazing, actually. 15 minutes, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, questions? Burkhardt? So actually we, sorry about the camera. We have a microphone here. Thank you. Thank you very much for showing us that integration of nature. <laughs> sorry, you're good now. Thank you. Um, what I'm worried about is a little bit about the fact that 
is, I think, a very key element in nature from our universe, all the things we have to see happening on our Earth. Um, and it only appears in the sort of modeling of generative AI. Could you comment on that? What the sort of role randomness and all the other elements are? Yeah, because that, I think, is a key element of our life. Absolutely. So it's something. I kept it short. You know, I could talk about randomness, another keynote, you know, and to keep it short is something. What is the efficient at the opposite of randomness? Well, we could call it efficiency. Okay. And what is the op uh, opposite of efficiency is entropy. Okay. So randomness is something it goes into, you know, entropy, you can translate it into chaos, disorder, randomness. Okay. The problem is that, you know, we have our random number generators, but actually it's not so random as you know it. And as I know, it depends on the seed, etc. So I think technically, and I think this is what you are alluring to, technically it's very, very hard to produce true randomness, you know, with machines. That's why we try to focus on entropy, okay? And our approach is these diffusion models, okay? So I cannot give you specific numbers to quantify randomness, okay? But we validate it, we test it, we train it, and we can really go from uh, photos, text, to complete randomness, white noise, okay, statistically speaking, and reverse it, and there's an hall hallucinated picture the AI was not trained for. I see your face. I, I think this is not satisfying to you. So in a nutshell, randomness, yes, we need more randomness. Okay. Nature is driven by entropy. Forget about your final comment. You know, we had we all did you are a little bit older than me too. We all had these green technologies, energy efficiency. I think it's a wrong approach. We have to come from a different angle. You know, okay, copying nature, biomimicry is simple. Yeah. Thank you. So I actually have a question and then uh, oh. uh, we'll yield to others. Anybody else who would like to ask questions, please feel free to also uh, use the microphone. So, I mean, this is really interesting and looking at nature inspired computing has been around for a few years, but now I'm happy to see the nature inspired communication as well pick up. However, and especially in the DDPM model, it looks like we, have maybe too much faith in our, you know, attempts to uh, denoise and to improve entropy. But now with cybernetics, and as you mentioned, they're going to be like multifold more intelligent than us. Can we guarantee that they're not going to, you know, inject their own feedback into the cycle to counter that? Absolutely. And this is, you know, again, you know, it's, so this is another big topic you could have, could have a separate keynote on AI, generative AI, et cetera, et cetera. I, I tried always to emphasize the important parts, you know, so human in the loop AI. Okay. So it must be guaranteed that the human is in control of AI. You know, it's something, there's a design space. Once you study generative, a little, generative AI a little bit closer, humans can des, uh, define the design space, the output space of generative AI, and then decide whether this is acceptable or not, you know, you know, so this is something. So, and, and also, what I try to highlight, there's a lot of fear about AI, you know, distorting reality, trust in use and all that stuff. It's a big, big topic, you know, but I want to make only one point. Uh, Hyperintelligence is different from superintelligence. So the underlying assumption is there will be a beneficial symbiosis between humans. But this is, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a narrative, okay? And there's always with any technology, there's a danger to be misused by some dark motives, you know? Okay. So maybe we'll stay on the optimistic side of things. Uh, I'm, I'm always optimistic. At least optimistic. as building the technologies. I'm always optimistic. Thank you. Anwar? Very thought-provoking talk. Thank you. Uh, so I have, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to use the properties of nature to solve certain problems that you pretty much have to do. So, I see that like two, two uh, kind of contradictory things. Yes. Combine nature with uh, nature has billions of years. Right? And also nature, whatever nature produces, nature succeeds. Whereas here we are trying to achieve certain goals to fix our human. Whereas nature doesn't have goals like that. 
Yes. Oh. oh again. Very good questions, all of you. You know, this is this is now I could talk another not maybe not me, I'm not the most qualified nature, evolution, another keynote, maybe somebody else, you know. So timeline is I think that's the easiest part of your question. So when you talk to ecologists, this is this decade is the decisive one. So we have till 2030 to turn things around. So it's really short term. Okay, it doesn't, you know, it's not 2050. You know, this is decisive. So yes, nature, you know, maybe two comments. We, AI, the fundamental, not flaw, you know, I, I also like AI, but the fundamental limiting assumption is we humans tell AI how to think. You know, so we look in our brain and we try to build neural networks, you know, so the assumption is we are the intelligent ones, you know, and we build machines that get close or supersede our capabilities of what thinking reasoning. I try to keep it short, uh, you have to understand what intelligence is okay there's a difference between reasoning and intelligence. Okay, so this is something maybe we can discuss offline. Okay, actually, it's reasoning. It's not artificial intelligence. It's artificial reasoning. It's artificial computation. Intelligence is different. Okay, what else? Uh, nature. How can we learn? Yes, maybe final comment. It's really something we, our societies, consider nature as a resource. Okay, exploiting, you know, all these fossils is just one example. We consider nature as a resource to our means. But the trick is we have to make a shift in our thinking from resource to life source. We have to understand that there's life in, in nature and try to understand it better and then mimic it. You know, I know it, it will not satisfy you, but every aspect is, is a big topic, you know. But maybe the major part, like, like I said to Burkhardt, I think, uh, making a transition from efficiency to entropy. Okay, here, uh, going from uh, looking at nature as a resource to a life source, understand how nature produced life and then apply it to us. In, 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 and then I, I'm done with this response. So instead of adapting nature to us, we have to adapt, adapt us to nature. That's the big story behind it. Okay, otherwise, I think we are doomed, you know. Big questions, you know, but I started it, you know. Okay, so first of all, thank you for your talk and it's quite inspiring and interesting. Yeah, at the same time, uh, I had the feeling uh, when you showed the video of the, of the South Korean woman, like it kind of felt I. Um, uh, cyberpunkish dystopia we're heading to. Yes, yes, um, yes. Cyberpunk's very good term, yes. Yeah. Yes. And and I, I, I wanted to ask you, is this this research you're doing or this anti-metaverse research really something society wants and the people want? Or is it something that companies are pushing because they yes. think there's big money in it? What did I ask for? You know, you, yeah. you know, I opened Pandora's box, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, those big question. Does it society, okay, I try to, you know, it's, it's so I, I didn't re bother you with my books, okay, but you might read the second book, you know, okay, because it goes really from, it starts with technology and then it really becomes more and more philosophical, okay, so it's something, it's about, I don't want to, talk too much about it you know but it's something what does it mean to be human okay human condition you have to understand you know and then it's really something unaherent you know all this stuff you have to understand how humans are because humans make up society and what is the gap between our current human being and our potential okay i know it's very generic okay but like always there's a danger of just for profit Okay, and here you might remember teleology, telos, purpose, purpose-driven tokens. You know, it's Web3 is really about, it goes beyond profit. Purpose is defined, it's not only uh, monetary rewards, it's more 
a, a word might be nudging. Okay, again, controversial term. It's called a social engineering. My, you, we, you are manipulating us, you know, but it's a term from, from cognitive psychology. You can use some rewards very gently, you know, goodwill, you know, in order to improve our behavior. Yes, there's like, like with many technologies, there are dark sides. You can only make profit, you know, or, you know, use it for better purposes. Is it? It's, it's not the technology, it's the motivation of users, okay? So it's the same with AI, you know, Stephen Pinker, you might know him from Harvard University, he says, it's, it's, it's stupid to be afraid of AI, you know, because AI is more or less about intelligence, all this fear of AI is motivation. So how are users motivated to use this tool? And there are two types of users, you know, but. And then it gets bigger and bigger. Who says what's the purpose? You know, if it's purpose driven, who defines what's the? It's it's yeah. a big topic. You know, my, my my question was also more. I mean, there's it's a big philosophical discussion. Yes, issue. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask specifically you and your research team. Okay. Did you con? I mean, that's the follow up question. Did you consider these aspects? Have you done some user studies or? Uh, go into the wild and ask people what they think, have some demos shown them or... Um... Okay, so demos, no, yeah. so that's good. These no questions, are, answers are simpler. <laughs> demos, no, but we run experiments, you know, okay. really, you know, it's kind of, this is, you uh, know, these are, what are these public games, you know, it comes from uh, behavioral economics, okay, where you, it's not the simplistic assumption of human use, it's, uh, rational, self-interested, you know, but we take humans as they are. It's called behavioral economics, you know, and then you can use trust game, uh, all these games, you know, we, we, we use them with technology, AI, robots, and see, and see the impact of technology on human behaviors. There's no demo, but we have publications okay. of that, you know. Okay, thank you very much. And you want, thank you. So last two questions. Hey, uh, another big question, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I think the previous question has stole some yeah. of my questions. Yeah. Um, what did I start? Because <laughs> it's a bit more social oriented. And yeah. you spoke about the metaverse. And this is when I hear about it, that's a vision that I would have run screaming in the opposite direction. Oh, well, I want to live in. Yeah. Um, don't want to live forever as some yeah. fake digital copy. Yeah, 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 and yeah. that, sorry, that Korean woman with the, that video was the most terrifying thing I have ever yeah. seen. Um, so really, you've got people who don't want to live this sort of life. Yes. How do you see this being implemented? How do yes. you see people who don't want to be involved yes. in this sort of vision? Is this, how do you see this being implemented? In yes, I, I, I fully agree, you know, so, and here's a confession. Sharif knows it, you know, personally, I don't have a smartphone, okay? So not because I couldn't afford it, but because I see all the dark sides, you know, what technology does with us, okay? Screen slaves, staring at the screens, you know, becoming less and less social. It's just a personal example, okay? I saw all the social networks I was touching on these, our presumable social networks are everything but social, okay? The behavior, you know, the hate speech, everything. Now metaverse, yes, it can be another, turn of bad technologies, you know, or we we try to have an impact, okay, in order to guide this development. How to do that, I think there are like always two camps, okay, you know, and I try with my little research, you know, to, to emphasize the bright sides, the positive sides of the metaverse. And there's not even a definition of the metaverse out there. So I think it's too early to make a decision. This is metaverse, this is bad or, or, or good. My research is, is geared towards using for the better side. How to do that? I think we have, and this that's why I touched on this, we have to talk to cognitive psychologists. So how do we humans think and behave? And then taking it from there. So how do we stop, and I'll finish up, so how do we stop what's happened with the existing social networks? Well, that's a, the, 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 that's a very, very short, that's easy to answer. You know, it's what's his name, the father of VR. Jerry, I think, you know, is this, this you know, Rasta, you know, he's the father of VR, you know, he recommends, you know, simply stop using it for six months. You know, that's his recommendation. So don't use any social media for six months. 
you know, and then see see what happens with our society. You know, just turn it off. That's his recommendation, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Salid. Question. Big one, please. <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, no, no, now a small one, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll focus on a technical question. Uh, yes. I know you, you didn't have time to get into uh, blockchains. You sort yes. of mentioned that. Now, blockchain relies a lot on determinism, right? Because yes. all the nodes have to agree on. Stuff. Yes. Whereas uh, there's a lot of randomness in what yes, Burkhard yes. asked this question. So, how do you see that uh, reconciled? Yes, yes, very good question. Good question, you know, because this opens up another box, you know, the blockchain, you know, it's, it's, I need to go back, you know, it's something, it's this, uh, in nature, you have a, uh, you know, this is a, really a new research area, this tree fungi mutualism, okay, and it works rewards, you know, so it's kind of a reciprocity, exchanging rewards. And I think this should be realized by using blockchain tokens. Okay, as you know, Web three is very different from Web two. We are currently Web two, meaning you know you can read and write. All these media platforms we have, LinkedIn, etc., is Web two. Your data is abused by men in the middle to make a profit. Okay, Web three. I hope you know that it will be different. Micro payments or tokens, you know. And these tokens should not be necessarily monetary tokens. You know, it can be something non-monetary, like rewards, you know, like, you know, social uh, metrics, like equality, you know. We have a paper out there, you know, and maybe I forgot the second speaker, afraid of metaverse. Nobody has a single defined metric for metaverse. So how do we measure metaverse is it throughput no it's not delay what is it what does it to society so you need to come up with new metrics and i think web3 is key and my hope is on decentralizing systems and trust mechanisms and this as you know is, is at, at the heart of, of, of blockchain so token trust decentralization i think this is the path forward oh uh oh <laughs> Well, that's, that that's that's my wife. You know. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Yes. I have a question. You were talking about infinite reality. Yes. So I would like to know. I have two questions actually. Oh. <laughs> the first one is, what is your meaning of eternal life? And the second one is, what is the impact of the technology on the eternal yes, life? Yes, that's good questions. Like always. Oh, what's meaning of eternal life? <laughs> Next time I give a more technical <laughs> presentation, you know, I, I think it was the wrong idea, you know. Something, but and but this is really what we are up to, okay? So eternal life, it's its how to define it. It's, well, simply put, it has no beginning, no end, okay? This is eternity has no beginning, no end. Impact of technology, I think this is uh, easier to answer, you know. With all these, you know, chat GPT, you know, what we, witness you you have seen all these pic, uh, pictures you know i don't know trump uh arrested by police the pope wearing certain jackets you know so reality is disappearing okay reality is hard to is it true or of or, or, or fake okay many people think it's it's a danger okay while well, reality is is disappearing and then i'm very short and then i'm done one more sentence you know and again, it gets very, you are from India, I guess, Sri Lanka close, you know, the, the bigger question is, what is reality? Is this reality, the true reality, you know, and, but then it gets really a little bit philosophical, you know, so my hope, and then I'm done, hopefully, you know, uh, my hope is that all these uh, chat GPT generative AI they make us question what is reality. And maybe this reality is not reality, the true nature of reality. We don't have to go to, to I don't know, philosophies, religion. Think of quantum mechanics. You know, all these big scientists, Max Planck, they always said, you know, this is not reality we, we see, okay? The real reality is something different. Maybe this metaverse, and here, I, and then I'm done, maybe opens a portal into this deeper type of reality. Yes. Thank you very much. Oh, Thank you, Dr. Martin. Really. <laughs>
So again, we thank our keynote speaker, Dr. Martin Meyer. This was very, really thought provoking. Yeah. I know we had a lot of other questions from the audience and please, I do invite you to uh, chat with Martin. I'm sure he would still like to entertain uh, more questions and answers. With that, we wrap up our first session. Please enjoy the coffee break and we see you back at 10.30. Thank you very much.